they put me last because you're all drunk now. <laughs> so first off, if you are still playing Match the Mental Illness, number one, it's not a thing we were actually doing. What's wrong with you? <laughs> number two, agoraphobia. Now, I'm going to talk Oh, that's what gets the laugh. Ha, <laughs> <laughs> he's got agoraphobia. <laughs> laugh at him. I'm about to talk some shit about Britain and life in Britain in this set. But I've got an American accent, so I should probably get something out of the way first. That customer service agent was me! <laughs> no, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm actually talking about the elephant in the room being American. So let me just say, guys, we tried. <laughs> All right? We have an entire system designed to keep people like Trump out of office. <laughs> Not the political legal system. No, that's doomed to fascism. No, I'm talking about the fact that we just have the fattiest, greasiest foods that just clog your arteries and no health care. <laughs> By all accounts, that man should be dead. <laughs> yeah, death gets a laugh. That's how you know it's Glasgow. <laughs> so, if I sound a little bitter, it's because I am. Uh, and Part of that is, you know, I came here to study oceanography in a math and stats department. Uh, now, I get incredibly seasick, and I'm no good at math. <laughs> but the one benefit I figured was, well, Scotland's really cloudy, I sunburn easily, that could work out, right? <laughs> in case you can't see what's going on there. Now we've got all that out of the way, let's dive into the meat of it. The title of my talk tonight is Science Doesn't Have Any Place in Civilized Society. <laughs> I should probably introduce myself a bit more. By day, I am a PhD student at the University of Strathclyde. By night, by night, I am reevaluating all my life choices. <laughs> As I mentioned, I work on the ocean. Uh, the ocean, you know, that vast, mostly unexplored, dark and hostile environment on the planet, it is very similar, bear with me here, to outer space. Bear with me here. There are, of course, the three major differences, though. Uh, the first is that the monsters in the ocean, however monstery they may look, are actually very closely related to us. The monsters in space, not so much. Uh, two is that, well, how do I put this? The ocean is a little bit, just, just a little bit, just a wee bit smaller than outer space. <laughs> and the third is that, well, ocean exploration is a bit difficult because it's hard to get funding. It's not really uh, getting all the attention the way space is because space is currently the pet project of a handful of billionaire supervillains. <laughs> It's always fun to, to talk to an audience like you guys, be, uh, you know, as opposed to like a rigid academic conference, because here, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> I'm being mean, I'm being really, really mean, because at conferences, like when you're actually talking, people are very, very reserved, uh, and then they get up there in the Q&A, and they're like, yes, uh, good talk, good talk, thank you. Uh, have you considered that everything is wrong, and you're a dumbass with dumbass ideas? <laughs> Dumbass. <laughs> I haven't, but I'll bring that on board. Thank you, sir. <laughs> In my work on the ocean, I am a mathematical modeler. Mathematical modelers look at the various disparate data that we have, and we try to construct mathematical equations that unite that data and tell a nice story to try and explain it. I've become very philosophical towards the end of my PhD. Uh, that's not a joke, what are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> philosophy is very serious, and I'm going to tell you why. Because rigorous philosophy of science, when done correctly, can help you actually quantify how meaningless your thesis is. <laughs> you see, you first have to define meaningless before you can get any traction. Definitions are really important. And let me give you an example by coming to the interactive part. Okay, so who do, I want to, who do I want to pick on? Who hasn't been picked on yet tonight? That 
<laughs> you know what? I don't, I don't actually care. Uh, <laughs> you, sir, how many oceans are there in the world? Oh my god. <laughs> We're actually looking for a number. <laughs> But I understand the confusion. <laughs> Give me a number. Six. Spot on. Right answer, right off the bat. Great. How many oceans do you think there are? Uh, seven? Spot on again! Six and seven, both right answers, because oceanographers don't really care. <laughs> or should I say, they do care about their own view. <laughs> Not the other guy's views. And there's a rich literature, literature debate about how many oceans there are. Is it seven, five, three, or just one big global ocean? To give you a better example of how screwy this is, uh, what do I say? Fucked. I can say fucked here, right? <laughs> so the Mediterranean Sea, for example, is a large sea uh, with a deep basin, mostly enclosed by land, has very limited interactions with larger bodies of water. Any other structure that looks like that is also going to be called a Mediterranean Sea, which means I have articles that I have to cite that talk about the Arctic Ocean as the Arctic Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> and at that point, I think it's just spiteful. <laughs> I want to actually teach you a little bit more about uh, some of the science that I am doing as a uh, mathematical ecologist, really. It's the ecology is the core part. Ecology is strongly dependent on very small-scale biological systems. One of which I'm looking at is the photosynthesis of small marine organisms called phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are a lot like plants. As I said, they do photosynthesis, which means they take in sunlight and carbon dioxide, they poop out oxygen, and we breathe their oxygen poop, and it sustains life. 80% of the oxygen in the atmosphere is phytoplankton poop. <sighs> <laughs> but photosynthesis is a very uh, complicated thing, and it, it runs into some issues because obviously, you know, sunlight, there's a lot of it, and it's carrying a lot of energy. If you build up vast chlorophyll reserves and try and take in everything and process everything, it, it's too much. You're going to start to burn up. Um, but then again, if you try and cut yourself off from all of that, you know, and, and just sink into the darkness of the ocean, well, then you don't have any energy and you're going to die. So even though sunlight can be very threatening and annoying and burn you, <laughs> even though it seems really imposing and scary, uh, if you approach it with a willingness to put in some work and some effort and some regulation, you know, you can actually make it a workable system. Uh, and this is the chapter of my thesis called Forced Metaphors for Brexit. <laughs> so I just love forced metaphors. Uh, my supervisor is going to make me change that title, but uh, <laughs> I'll sneak it in somewhere. <laughs> so photosynth photosynthesis um, is often described with respect to a specific variable called alpha. Alpha is often called photosynthetic efficiency, but it's not equivalent to photosynthetic efficiency, which is exactly what it sounds like. How efficient can you be at doing photosynthesis? Well, alpha can then be expressed as uh, two other terms. Uh, one is you know, the cross-section of chlorophyll. Basically, how much light can your chlorophyll actually capture? Which you could think of as photosynthetic efficiency. And you multiply that term by something called the maximum quantum yield, which is how much of the desired product can you, can you make out of how much you're actually intaking. And that is also analogous to photosynthetic efficiency. So if you're paying attention, I just said that photosynthetic efficiency is analogous to photosynthetic efficiency, which is equal to photosynthetic efficiency times photosynthetic efficiency. <laughs> I told you they were spiteful. <laughs> I've heard a lot of cynical things tonight, but I want to end on something more uplifting, more optimistic. Um, so there's all this negativity about academia, and at its core, science is still beautiful, it's still pure. Scientists are cocks. <laughs> but there's an interesting thing in oceanography, uh, which is that, well, the ocean's really big, it's really hard to get data for. We don't really have enough robots, and it's really expensive even if we did. And so going out and actually collecting the data is difficult because if you just throw a bunch of undergrads out there, they um, drown. <laughs> Do you 
grade any papers. Yeah. Monster! <laughs> but it's okay, it's okay, because one of the workarounds that oceanographers do is they can take instruments that will measure things like temperature or salinity or any other sort of factor that you want to get out of the physics of the ocean. And you can take that sensor, attach a transmitter, little antenna on top of it, and then you can glue that to the head of a seal. And then you have these really happy little seals, these little antennas sticking out. <laughs> And they're like, yay! And then you release them into the ocean, and everywhere they go, they're collecting data at that part of the ocean. And it's wonderful. Now, it's important to remember that these seals, you know, as useful as they are, they're not actually doing science. I wouldn't call them scientists <laughs> by any means. Now, you laugh, but, you know, the reason why is actually a little complicated. And, you know, talking it out with people could actually reveal just a bit how confusing this can kind of be. Because you might say, uh, do you know these seals, you know, the collecting data and all, but do you know why they're not actually scientists? Uh, because they're happy and free and can come and go as they please? No, not that. Oh, because they're actually inclusive and they don't differentiate based on gender or age or race. <laughs> they're not big and assholes. Good point, but not that either. <laughs> because they just collect the data, but they don't analyze it. They don't extract the meaning. They don't tell a bigger picture. Which is fair enough, they don't seem to care all that much. <laughs> but we do. We're, we're humans, and we do. And this is the important part. This is the optimistic part, is that we're humans. We're capable of extracting that meaning. We're capable of doing science. More importantly, we're capable of choosing the path that we want to go down. Do we want to be like these seals that are, you know, less restrictive, more inclusive, happier and kinder to each other. We have that choice. We as human beings get to decide, do we want to be happy like seals? Or do we want to just be a bunch of dicks to each other like lobsters? <laughs> well, I think you know which choice gets my seal of approval. <laughs>